Canada is home to a centuries-old legend. It's easier to avoid people here today than it was 150 years ago. History supports the possibility of a monster called Sasquatch. We've been coming here for years and years and kind of felt like we were being watched. At a remote fishing cabin in northern Ontario. The cabin had been broke into. It was a terrible mess. Science examines the evidence in a modern-day search for proof. Does that look like tissue to you? It kind of does. It's almost like it came from a wild human. Yep. They were probably watching us this whole time. They'd become the target of the beast's rage. We're cowering in here. I'm, I'm afraid for the first time. Did you hear that? Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Snellgrove Lake, pristine and remote, nestled in one of North America's great untouched wilderness areas in Ontario, 250 miles north of Canada's capital of Ottawa. Accessible only by float plane, it's a fisherman's paradise. There is a cabin here that is the focal point of a series of seemingly aggressive incidents by the creature Canadians call Sasquatch. This thing starts screaming at me, starts wailing at me. It freaked me right out. Like, I just, I couldn't believe it. It just freaked me right out. It's like a man that says, but the first thing you see is the long arms. It happened to walk off on two legs. To me, it sounded like an ape. So if there is a Sasquatch, perhaps this is what it's supposed to look like. Most describe a creature up to eight feet tall, upwards of 800 pounds, hairy and upright walking with long arms, no neck, and a human-looking face. The name Sasquatch can be traced to the 1920s when it was coined by J.W. Burns, a school teacher in British Columbia. Burns compiled Native American accounts of tall, man-like animals said to live in the forests. Each tribe had a different name, but Burns determined they were all talking about the same animal. An animal that this man believes could still be around. Scott Mossbeck owns the only single cabin fishing camp on Snellgrove Lake, which he rents to visiting fishermen. One fall, my father came in to check on the cabin because I'd forgot to put some antifreeze in the drains prior to leaving. He came in to do that and discovered the cabin had been uh, broke into. The refrigerator was ripped from the wall. He came over here, knocked all the plates, everything off the shelves, ripped the stove out, flipped it on the ground. I came over here and I said at least he didn't get in the shower room because the door was closed, but when I opened the door, the sink was on the ground. He jumped off, bent the shower door. All the shelves in the building were ripped down. The stove pipes were pulled down, soot everywhere. Everything was on the floor. Most of these outposts would be lucky to see 50 people in a season. There is uh, virtually no population, hardly anyone year-round, and only us visiting in the summer. Mossbeck says a creature has visited the camp regularly, seemingly angry about the cabin and sometimes the occupants. In 2003, Joe Frischella and some fishing buddies were enjoying a week of walleye and northern pike fishing at the camp when they were paid a midnight visit. We uh, flew in to Snellgrove Lake. We've been coming here for years and years. We always got this kind of weird feeling. Kind of felt like we were being watched. Maybe much like a zoo animal would feel. It was just a feeling that I could never shake every time we went back in this area. Later, the group heard what they described as distant wood knocking or pieces of wood banged together. They decided to knock back. The, the person who heard the wood knock said, let's try wood knocking and see if we can get some kind of response. Later that evening, their fears became real. And the one person in our party had gone to brush his teeth. And the moment he got in front of the kitchen window, 
the cabin started shaking and he heard this kind of screaming and screeching noise. Then the cabin started to shake, it started to vibrate. He felt like it, the cabin was being lifted. It, it really scared him and he ran over to try to wake up one of the dads and, and pounded him on the shoulder and tried to get him up and he couldn't get him up. Then the, the screaming and the cabin shaking just stopped. Frischella and his buddies found no evidence of what attacked the cabin that night, nor has Mossbeck found an explanation for the extensive cabin damage that same year. He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. The largest town close to us would be 10,000 people, and that's 200 miles away. Historically, most reports of property damage in remote areas can be attributed to bears in search of food. Dr. Lynn Rogers is a wildlife biologist specializing in black bear research in Ely, Minnesota. Rogers has seen the damage bears can inflict on remote cabins and has viewed the Mossbeck tape. The thing that just hit me about it was how thoroughly that cabin was trashed. Everything was on the floor and broken up and tipped over and heavy things. It was obviously something strong that did it. Right away, my first thought would be bear. But this is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. If they go for the refrigerator, they very often uh, are not going so much for the contents in there, but for the insulation. And formaldehyde is one of the ingredients of making this, and it breaks down into formic acid, which smells like uh, an ant colony. And so then you look for bite marks and, and claw marks where they tore open the inside of the refrigerator to get the, to the insulation. I didn't see any of that in this case. I really am baffled about what did this. Tom Steenberg is a Sasquatch researcher from Mission, British Columbia. We have more wilderness than most European countries have total land mass. So the idea that something uh, unknown could exist here, uh, not discovered, is no shock to me at all. It's easier to avoid people here today than it was 150 years ago, in my opinion. We no longer have nomadic First Nations tribes moving from one area to point A to point B. Um, we no longer have the vast amount of mountain men making their living off the land like we used to in the past. So the total number I would say would, in Canada, in my guess, is about 150 to 200 a year. Well, the same total number in the United States would probably be about three to four times as much due to the density population and the wilderness areas available south of the border. So I would guess anywhere between 450 and 500 reports a year. But is there hard evidence to support the stories of an up to eight foot tall, 800 pound Sasquatch? In 2003, Mossbeck laid out a common bear deterrent at the door of the Snow Grove cabin, a bed of screws. This is what we made for the creatures that have broken into our cabin in the past. This is where the remnants of the blood was from the la last time. It was a few few days old when we found it. Uh, it had been about three days since we'd been here. And that's how we set it when we leave if we're gonna be gone for more than a day. You ready to go? We're all loaded. One of you can go in and go co-pilot. Okay, I will. Okay, you're in first up through the center. Next best seat. The blood evidence. The remote location and the high number of encounters make Snell Grove Lake a prime spot for a monster quest search. Mossbeck asks scientists Jeff Meldrum and Kurt Nelson to investigate. If Sasquatches are real, that they probably are in Canada. From the air, it's simply uh, uh, awe-inspiring, the, the expansiveness of the, of the wilderness. 
Given the, the location and, and the lack of population around here, it certainly wouldn't surprise me for something like that animal to be able to live here without being detected. There are very few trails, uh, very few uh, pathways through this wilderness uh, on foot. For all practical purposes, the bush in between these lakes is unexplored. Dr. Kurt Nelson is a microbiologist at the University of Minnesota. He's anxious to examine the screwboard for any remaining blood, hair, or tissue. DNA could provide the most conclusive proof of the creature's identity. This is really uh, a remarkable spot. Thanks. Wow, oh, this is great. It's a good flight. So this is the nail board that Chuck made to prevent an that animal from coming back in here and wrecking the place. Right. And uh, he said that there was a good blood stain on it. Right. Uh, somewhere in here in the center, he said there was quite a pool of blood, but I guess it's been sitting out here in the weather for the past two years, and, and at this point, I don't see anything remaining. Yeah, if there was a dried sample of blood there, that'd be worth taking, but anything that's been subjected to the weather is gonna be totally degraded DNA. The uh, backside may have preserved a sample that we could use. Well, there is a stain there. It looks like this is where it was. There's some material clinging to these, the threads on these screws in a few places. Uh, does that look like tissue to you? It kinda does. Well, maybe this is tissue. We should probably... Uh, Collect a sample just to be on the safe side, take it back and have a closer look at it in the lab. Yeah, okay, so I'm just gonna take a little bit of this. It's stiff, it's really, it's really dried onto these screws. It's hard to get it off. I didn't hold out much hope for the possibility of uh, DNA from this old blood sample, but with these threaded screws and what may be tissue samples, it's a whole new ball game. Who or what left the flesh, blood, and hair behind? The answers may be as easy as connecting the dots. So if you start just on this edge where the blood leaked behind and look at the screws that have this tissue on them, I think that one maybe does. This one is for sure covered. I'll mark that one. And that uh, one's too rusty, you right. can't tell. That one for sure. This one I'm not quite, let me, let me look, because this helps. It almost seems to have a hair attached to it. Well, we'd call it a fiber at this stage of the investigation. Yeah. So, I don't know, do you think it's a positive screw? It's kind uh, of questionable. I'd say it's questionable. That one for sure. Here. What if we just now try to connect the dots and just get an overall idea of uh, the general shape of what we're looking at and size uh, of this? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. do a quick purview of the whole periphery because that's where hair mites now. Dr. Kurt Nelson yeah. and Dr. Jeff Meldrum are examining the blood-soaked screw doormat that camp owner Scott Mossback put on the cabin porch. Oh, that one looks interesting. Look at that. Oh, wow. They have found blood, hair, and tissue. We have no nails over here. Yeah, there just is no nail. Then we end up with something that looks more like this. The bloody outline reveals what appears to be a large footprint. But it doesn't take a lot of imagination to extend that out, and you've got, essentially, the outline of a Sasquatch footprint. This simulation illustrates Nelson and Meldrum's theory the creature put its full weight on the screws, forcing them an inch into its foot. The creature likely was shocked and stepped back off the porch the same way it had entered, ripping hair and large pieces of tissue from the foot as it left. So I'd say we're looking at a footprint that is at least 17, if not 18 inches long.
the, the flesh samples uh, were, were stunning uh, as, as we, we noticed it. I mean, I, at first I was a little dubious that we'd have anything worthwhile given the length of time that it had been out in the weather. But as we began to look closer and what had appeared to be just red paint, then obviously was not, was, was dried blood, and the pattern of distribution was quite distinct. So uh, there's a very good likelihood we'll be able to get DNA from that sample, at least enough to determine whether it was just a bear or whether it was something with a much larger, very distinctively shaped foot. One of the first white men to document evidence of the Canadian creature was explorer David Thompson. In 1811, while searching for a waterway from the Hudson Bay to the Columbia River, Thompson discovered something unexpected. January 7th, continuing our journey in the afternoon, we came on the track of a large animal. The snow about six inches deep in the ice. I measured its four large toes, each of four inches in length, to each a short claw. The ball of the foot sunk three inches lower than the toes. The hinder part of the foot did not mark well. The length, 14 inches by eight inches in breadth. The men and Indians would have it be a young mammoth, and I held it to be the track of a large old grizzly bear. Yet the shortness of the nails, the ball of the foot, and its great size was not that of a bear. The 18-inch print found by Meldrum and Nelson is surprisingly similar in size to the print described by explorer David Thompson. The prints resemble that of a black bear, commonly found throughout the area, but black bear paws generally max out at around nine inches. The much larger Kodiak and polar bear have paws as large as 14 or 15 inches, but their range is much further west and north. Footprints constitute the largest body of existing evidence, but for the trained eye, much can be learned from an animal track. It isn't just looking at tracks or the other signs that are out there, as long as we can keep our eyes and all our senses opened up to the whole world that's right there in front of us. What is real exciting is to follow these tracks because they tell you everything what's going on with the animal. Where is he going? What's he eating? How's he living his life? So in essence, tracking an animal tells more of a story than just seeing an animal for that fleeting second. Kiefer Irwin is a professional tracker. In August of 1984, while on vacation in Canada, she found tracks she could not explain. We had been seeing grizzly tracks. We saw black bear that day. We were seeing caribou and moose, and we had seen all these tracks within that week. But these were something different of what I had not, not seen before. I recognized the track itself as a human-type track. But what befuddled us was that it was 16 inches long. It's width approximately seven inches wide and two inches of an impression, which meant something very heavy had put those tracks down. And it wasn't just one track. There were five of them. Between those tracks was a good four to five feet of a stride. Somebody said it could have been a grizzly standing up walking, but these had no claw marks. They had toes, but no claw marks. And a, a grizzly's claws, which extend out a good few inches from the front of its toes, would have definitely made an impression in that wet sand. We kind of nonchalantly, very casually said, yeah, must be a Sasquatch. You know, we were almost very lighthearted about it. We just said it, because, you know, there wasn't anything else it could could have possibly have been. There was nothing. Back at Snowgrove Lake, Meldrum and Olson find something. A diary that apparently belonged to a fisherman who rented the cabin a decade ago. This dates to uh, 8, 9, 95. Fifth day here at the cabin. Uh, they found an unidentified footprint 
on the portage to Broken Mouth River, which appeared to be about a size 16, triple E, wow. uh, barefoot, human-type footprint. Huh. See, like Do you know where that is on the map? I've got a map right here. Uh -huh. This is my field map. Good. So we're here. Mm -hmm. Broken Mouth is down here. Just right. to probably. So the portage about two must miles be from us. It must be right in through here. Right through there. Boy, it's quiet and still out here. Hello. Hello. Nelson and Meldrum have developed a simple strategy. Surround the cabin with camera traps and make lots of noise to draw a creature in. There's kind of a nice opening back here. We can maybe position it to watch that. Meldrum believes the creature is unafraid of humans and may even initiate contact. He plans to target this behavior. Across here. Right. Stealth cam digital camera traps are strategically placed in the forest near the cabin. Okay, now we gotta set it up. Okay. All right, let's go. One, two, three. There you go. Nelson will set out to the Broken Mouth River Portage mentioned in the fisherman's diary. The trip is more difficult than anticipated. The three mile creek from Snellgrove Lake leading to Broken Mouth River is now low and strewn with boulders and small logs. Yeah, I think that probably the best way to see one isn't to go out and find it yourself because I don't think uh, you can stalk one. I don't know, people don't know how to do that. I think the best thing to do is to try to attract them to you. So my goal in coming on this trip was to go up by myself. I wanted to be by myself on a, on a remote outpost camp where the rest of the guys were back at, at the cabin so that I could separate myself from all of that and maybe um, make myself more attractive to a Sasquatch that could approach and be interested in human beings because they seem to be. There's lots of cases of them coming into camps. Kurt has targeted a camping spot on the opposite side of the lake, a 200-foot-wide moss-covered rock located near a swamp and an open area that will be covered with camera traps. Great bed. Well, Kurt, this should prove to be an interesting night. I hope so. It's about 10 o'clock. I got dropped off by those guys about three hours ago, and I've been busy setting up camera traps and I think good spots off the end of the clearing where I'm camped in. It's beginning to rain, actually, a little bit, and uh, so that's all for now. Back at camp, Meldrum is reaching out. He wants to try something Snellgrove fisherman Joe Frischella tried in 2003, wood knocking. Wood knocking is a common communication device used by great apes. It allows the animals to communicate over long distances. So far, it's a one-way conversation. It's uh, 3.30 a.m. and it's been raining like crazy. I've been in my sleeping bag for a while in this little tent to stay out of the rain. Hours pass and Nelson is having a long night. And I'm gonna try doing some rock banging. I'm gonna bang two rocks together to see if I can make a, a good smacking sound. And uh, I'm gonna try hollering off into the wilderness too, just to see if I get any kind of a reply from that. Check back later. 
At Snowgrove Lake, Ontario, where men tread seldom, there is a cabin. As strange as it sounds, this cabin has allegedly been violated more than once by a large unknown animal, believed to be a Sasquatch. But this is not the first account of an aggressive Sasquatch. Albert Osman lived fairly close to my home and I got to know him very well. I've interviewed him numerous times. John Green is a retired Canadian journalist and a leading researcher into the Bigfoot phenomenon. He is a graduate of both the University of British Columbia and Columbia University, and has a database of more than 3,000 sighting and track reports, earning him the nickname Mr. Sasquatch. While researching his book, Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us, Green interviewed Canadian outdoorsman Albert Ostman, recording his detailed and strange account. Ostman claimed he was kidnapped and held captive by a family of Sasquatch in 1924 while he was prospecting in British Columbia, Canada. This is the actual audio recording of Ostman's account made in 1966. I was out on a prospecting trip. Mm -hmm. I was in, I think it was about six or seven days. Then I was camping at the place there. and they uh, began to bother me at night there. I thought first there would be porcupines or probably bear or something, mm -hmm. but uh, evidently there was something else. And uh, that went on for about three, four nights. And finally one night I was picked up by, in my sleep and carried away. He carried me for, I don't know, oh, probably three, four hours. Then I was let down in the, in the valley, where, uh, of course, it was dark, you know. I heard a lot of chatter around. It's a little after four o'clock in the morning when he let me down. Ostman claimed the creature carried him in a sleeping bag, which also contained food supplies and his rifle. Ostman didn't feel threatened by the strange creatures, but he also didn't feel free to leave, so he settled in and made his own camp. Finally, when they got lighter, I noticed these people around me, four of them, two big ones and two small ones, but they were all covered with hair and no clothes. Never bothered me. They, evidently, they had some reason why they wanted me there. I had uh, enough wood gathered up so I cook coffee. And I guess the aroma from that brought him near and he was sitting about 10 feet away from me when I was drinking my coffee. And then I opened a box of snuff, you see? And I, when I opened that and took a pinch, you know, he reached out for it, you know. And he emptied it right in his mouth. And, and he swallowed it. And uh, that didn't feel very good, you know. Tastes very good, I guess so. And then he, he had to have something to drink, I guess. So he grabbed that and he drank the coffee can, ground and all. As a result of the snuff and the coffee, the beast ran off, likely looking for water. That's when Osman made his escape. It's not a story that anybody would be inclined to believe today. The problem is that the descriptions that he gave of these individuals uh, have been consistently supported throughout the years by you know, subsequent observations. If the Ostman Sasquatch, like the Snellgrove creature, is real, they must eat. Dr. Meldrum struggles with whether this wilderness has enough food sources to sustain a large beast. An animal uh, that is uh, at one with its surroundings, like a Sasquatch or any other animal that, that frequents these areas, would certainly find ample resources uh, abounding here in the Canadian forest. Snellgrove Lake and the surrounding area is frozen all but 10 to 12 weeks a year. 
an 800-pound animal would likely need more than just lichen, berries, and roots to sustain itself. But Meldrum may have found another source. One of the plentiful food sources here in the North Bush are spruce grouse, which are uh, rather tame, unafraid of, of humans. And um, as an experiment, I attempted to hunt one down myself and was able to stalk one to within a few feet. Had I wanted to dispatch it, it would have been very easy to do so, uh, even by hand, let alone picking up a stone and uh, uh, knocking it down or knocking it from a low tree branch where they often roost. Meldrum theorizes Sasquatch would most likely be nomadic moving through the area during the months of June, July, and August, when food sources are at their peak. The same time, fishermen inhabit the cabin at Snowgrove Lake. For Meldrum and Nelson, bad weather may have hampered last night's efforts. It is already late on day three, and Meldrum is anxious to pick up Nelson from his remote camping spot. Ah, I'm glad to see you guys. Yeah, oh, okay. Must have been a fun experience. Oh, it was neat, but it rained a lot. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear anything. I, uh, I had the camera traps out. It is the team's final night at Snowgrove Lake. After three days of noise and foraging, they are still holding out hope for an encounter. The huge fire acts as a beacon, its glow visible for miles. The team is waiting with infrared and thermal cameras to see into the night. They are ready, or so they think. At around midnight, without warning, something happens. They were probably watching us this whole time. Of course, of course they were. Something has thrown a rock at the camp. Did you hear that? That rock was a pretty good size. I'm still shaking. It I sounded it, to I me like it still hit from that it. side and hit this. I thought it walk. came over the crest. It was into this side. Uh, uh, walk to the edge of the building. No, please. Kurt, just, just stay here. Just We've had action now. We've had rocks moment. thrown at us. Throughout history, the Canadian wilderness has been home to hunters, trappers, and explorers. It may also be home to a monster. People now, the general population, has more knowledge of the, the subject as a whole. And now people can, without too much difficulty, find someone to actually report it to, whereas in the past, no one had any idea who to report something like this to. The Sasquatch is similar to other creatures seen around the world, but is also different. The Yeti is said to be a quadruped, or an ape that moves on all fours. The Almasti is a Russian wild man that is more like man than ape and uses fire. Sasquatch is more like an ape or unknown primate. Most reports also point to how elusive and shy these animals are, avoiding human contact, but not always. Sasquatch sightings happen when they come close to people, not the other way around. Most eyewitness encounters end as suddenly and harmlessly as they began, but not at Snowgrove. Eyewitnesses claim this beast does not seem to like visitors. Oh, I don't know what would make that sound. I wasn't that close to it, but I really heard it. I, I can't believe it. I really can't believe it. Without warning, a rock flies out of the woods and hits the cabin. Right, one of us was urinating off the porch about when the first stone hit the side of the cabin. This rock on the side of the building was bang. That's scary. It's, it's amazing. Huh? It's always stuff you hear about that doesn't happen to you. I've been in the woods a lot. I camped a lot. And I was out in the woods all by myself last night. Camera crews scan the immediate area with the night vision and thermal cameras as the team retreats into the cabin. That's yeah. so weird. This is, this is quite exciting, I have to admit. I've not experienced anything quite this dramatic before. One crew member threw a rock back into the woods, only to have another rock thrown back. Uh, and that was followed shortly after by a, a rather larger rock uh, bouncing down the roof of the cabin. Um, this is quite, quite distinct. Uh, obviously, there's nothing in the woods 
that's uh, recognized anyway that can lob rocks in that fashion. And we're all together. I'm with everybody, so I know that it's nobody goofing around. While one cameraman scouts around the area, the rest of the team locked themselves into the cabin for the night. We came in from outside and we're, we're, we're cowering in here. I'm, I'm afraid for the first time and it was for sure a rock and it was for sure on the roof of the building. Yeah, so we've, we're back inside the cabin at the moment. We've turned down the lights inside and so we can get a better view through the windows and just see if anything uh, goes through our uh, line of sight. The morning could not come soon enough for Meldrum, Nelson, and the entire crew. And at first light, the camp's owner, Chuck Mossback, has returned to fly the crew out. What happened? And we really had some action last night. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it was amazing. Um, An examination of the area reveals no tracks or other evidence. But whatever hit the roof that night may still be there. Only primates use tools as weapons. Rock and stick throwing is common in chimps and great apes. Good throwing rock. Whatever or whomever threw the rocks at the cabin is never revealed. But Meldrum and Nelson leave with an ample supply of blood, hair, and tissue from the screwboard. Todd DeSattel of New York University's microbiology lab has agreed to run DNA tests on the blood and tissue samples. If it is not too degraded or too old, um, we can probably recover DNA from it. Well, let's get this uh, exported to the server and we'll go run the analysis. Not only can this exacting process reveal the identity of a known creature, but it could be the best way to identify a new species like a Sasquatch. Once we can recover DNA, we can amplify it, make billions of copies of it in a matter of hours in the laboratory, and then we can see, do we have an exact match to something that's known, or is it closely related to something that's known? It will take several weeks before DNA tests reveal a missing link or known creature. The large quantity of tissue and hair will allow for numerous tests. Hair morphology is a much faster examination and also can reveal much about what stepped on the screws at the cabin. If this is just the hair of a known animal like a bear, Dr. Lynn Rogers, a wildlife biologist in Ely, Minnesota, should be able to quickly identify it. Northern Canada is mostly a vast, uninhabited wilderness. But even with a small human population, eyewitnesses occasionally report encounters with Sasquatch. This man first recorded finding 14-inch tracks in 1811. This man claims the animal shook his fishing cabin. And this cabin fishing camp at Ontario's Snellgrove Lake has become the scene of multiple incidents. But by what? And why? He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. The largest town close to us would be 10,000 people, and that's 200 miles away. One expert says he does not believe a bear is responsible for the cabin's destruction. Right away, my first thought would be bear. But this is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. And an unknown beast left an 18-inch bloody footprint at the scene. And one of the things that, that impresses me is this is much larger than uh, what we might expect for a bear footprint. History supports the possibility Sasquatch may be real. But will science support the probability? The morphology exam on the hair found in the screws is complete. 
So I looked at I looked at the hair under a microscope and compared it to every other North American mammal, especially the ones that live in northern northern Ontario, and it didn't match with anything, and it's certainly not bear. Uh, it looked human to me, but um, there were two important differences in the morphology. One is that uh, under a microscope there was no m medulla. Human hair has a spongy center mass of tissue called the medulla and the other one that it had a naturally worn tip, a tapered tip. This had not been cut. It's almost like it came from a wild human. That left me confused about what it could be, and I'll be really interested to see what the DNA shows. Mitochondrial DNA is the most accurate method known for species identification, and should be able to pinpoint whether the hair sample is that of a man, or a non-human primate. Once we can recover DNA, we can amplify it, make billions of copies of it in a matter of hours in the laboratory, and then we can sequence those copies. We can determine the exact linear sequence of the DNA bases, the A, C's, G's, and T's. Once we have those, we can compare them to a database of basically all the known living organisms on the planet today. But Professor Dissetel has hit a wall extracting DNA. We actually did not get DNA, so in, in a sense, I don't even have a result. There was not DNA present in the material given to us. Either that material was so degraded that any viable DNA within it had basically been destroyed by other organisms or by um, nature, or those were not biological samples. Dr. Kurt Nelson also has been doing DNA tests on the blood, hair, and tissue samples, and suspects there is an unknown substance or inhibitor present that is interfering with the DNA extraction. Nelson must first identify the inhibitor and then remove it from the sequence. The inhibitor has been identified. The galvanizing on the screws was mixed in with the animal DNA Nelson can now nudge DNA from the purified samples. The scientific evidence at this point is suggesting that there really is an animal there. I cut it out, I repurified it, and I amplified it again using the same primers. I got a very strong reaction when I did that. And the reason was that I had gotten rid of the inhibitory stuff by running it out that way. And I found that it was identical to human DNA except it had one nucleotide polymorphism. That nucleotide that was different was a difference that is shared with chimpanzees. I got DNA that was primate DNA, and I knew that I might be looking at the DNA of a Sasquatch. The DNA says primate, but not quite human, and not quite non-human primate. One of the base pairs is deviated. Well, the thing we have to do now is we have to look at more DNA. We have to sequence more of it. We have to design primers to amplify different regions of the DNA so that we can get sequence across the mitochondrial genome and determine whether or not it is just human DNA, which seems unlikely that something that a human would step on that board like that. Great apes share nearly identical DNA with man, except for a 35 base pair deviation. The Snellgrove DNA sample has only one deviation. According to Nelson, there is only a one in 5,000 chance this is human DNA. What we're looking at is the blood so far. So if we can find that the same sequence exists in the tissue and in the hair, that indicates that an animal, um, that the animal that bled there and, and left the tissue there and left the hair there was all the same animal and produced that sequence. That's important to tie it all together. And that could take a year. It appears science may support the probability of a primate that is not quite human and not quite ape. But just what left the bloody footprint at that Snell Grove Lake cabin? Is it possible that the creature of Snell Grove Lake is a real animal? You add it all up and it's very interesting. In the end, the creature of Snell Grove Lake may really roam the forests of Canada. Whether this creature is a genetically mutated man or a yet to be discovered animal, the Monster Quest search will return to Snellgrove Lake for a more extensive search. 
a search for a legend that might finally step out from the dark shadows and into the light of reality. At a remote fishing camp, something has unleashed its wrath. The refrigerator is ripped from the wall. When Monster Quest first investigated, a legendary creature may have turned up its aggression. This rock on the side of the building was bang. And since then, the cabin has been attacked again. And all of a sudden, something was thrown at the cabin. Now, Monster Quest returns with a new search, a new plan, and a new opportunity to analyze some of the most startling evidence collected. If there is any DNA left there, we should be able to, uh, to read it. And a shocking discovery suggests they may be closing in. It was eight feet tall, blacker than black. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Ontario, Canada, one of North America's great untouched wilderness regions. It is an outdoorsman's paradise. But there is something else here, something that does not want visitors and will turn aggressive to keep them away. Cabin had been uh, broke into. It kind of felt like we were being watched. There's nothing in the woods that can throw a rock. He made such a mess that at first I thought it had to be kids. I didn't believe even an animal would do it, but there's no way for them to get here. I told him, I said, it wasn't a man. I said, it looked like this. It actually sounded like two individuals, one over here and one over here. I don't think it was trying to play with us. I think we were food. The creature, described by some to be hair covered, six to 10 feet tall, equal to the size of a Kodiak bear, but walking upright, it has 17-inch feet, long arms, and is believed to weigh in at nearly 1,000 pounds and is capable of shaking a fishing cabin to its foundation. It fits the historical description of a Sasquatch. The epicenter of these mysterious creature reports may be Snellgrove Lake, Ontario, just 250 miles north of Manitoba's capital of Winnipeg. In August of 2006, Researchers investigating reports of a threatening creature at the cabin were themselves victims to rocks being thrown during the dark of night. Did you hear that? That rock was a pretty good size. I'm still shaking. It, was, it sounded to me like it hit on. that side and hit this. I thought it walk. came over the crest to this side. side. And walked to the edge of the building. No, All right, one of us was urinating off the porch. But when the first stone hit the side of the cabin. And this rock on the side of the building was bang. And it's scary, it's, it's amazing. It's always stuff you hear about that doesn't happen to you. I've been in the woods a lot, I camped a lot, and I was out in the woods all by myself last night. Camera crews scanned the immediate area with night vision and thermal cameras. Yeah, this, yeah. Is weird. This, is, this is quite exciting, I have to admit. I've not experienced anything quite this dramatic before. One researcher threw a rock back into the woods. Uh, and that was followed shortly after by a, a rather larger rock uh, bouncing down the roof of the cabin. Um, this is quite, quite distinct. Uh, obviously, there's nothing in the woods that's uh, recognized anyway that can lob rocks in that fashion. We're all together. I'm with everybody, so I know that it's nobody goofing around. A cameraman scouted around the area, while others on the team observed from the cabin. We've turned down the lights inside and so we can get a better view through the windows and to see if anything goes through our uh, line of sight. I'm afraid for the first time, and it was for sure a rock, and it was for sure on the roof of the building. A search of the area the following day confirmed their suspicions. A rock the size of a tennis ball was found on the roof. Who? or what had thrown it. Perhaps the creature that left this, a 17-inch bloody footprint. In 2002, at the same isolated cabin, something unknown completely ransacked the interior. Nearly everything was ripped from the walls, including the bathroom sink. Everything was on the floor. 
cabin owner Chuck Mossback is quite certain it wasn't due to vandals. There's no way in other than flying in. The likely culprit, a bear, was ruled out for several reasons. This is sometime between October 1st and the middle of the winter. Bears up that far north, towards the north edge of their range, should be in hibernation during that time. Wildlife biologist Dr. Lynn Rogers, who specializes in black bear research in Ely, Minnesota, explains why the damage to the refrigerator is significant. If they go for the refrigerator, they very often uh, are not going so much for the contents in there, but for the insulation. And formaldehyde is one of the ingredients of making this, and it breaks down into formic acid, which smells like uh, an ant colony. And so then you look for bite marks and, and claw marks where they tore open the inside of the refrigerator to get the, to the insulation. I didn't see any of that in this case. As a deterrent, the owner of the cabin had laid out a bed of screws, and it worked. A 17-inch bloody footprint was left behind, along with tissue. MonsterQuest retrieved the tissue, and subsequent DNA analysis revealed potentially startling results. And I found that it was identical to human DNA, except it had one nucleotide polymorphism. That nucleotide that was different was a difference that is shared with chimpanzees. I got DNA that was primate DNA. According to some scientists, there is only a one in 5,000 chance the DNA is human, and further testing is required. The thing we have to do now is we have to look at more DNA. We have to sequence more of it. We have to design primers to amplify different regions of the DNA so that we can get sequence across the mitochondrial genome and determine whether or not it is just human DNA which seems unlikely that something that a human would step on that board like that. In an effort to identify the origin of the nail board samples, further DNA analysis will be conducted. MonsterQuest will send the tissue samples to an institution that will pick up the testing where Nelson left off. At the same time, a new team of researchers returns to the shores of Snellgrove Lake in search of more evidence. Dr. Jeff Meldrum, a professor of anthropology at Idaho State University, was part of the 2006 expedition. He is returning to the isolated camp for a second time to find out just what was throwing rocks at him during his last visit. Well, on this trip, I, I'm hoping that we'll have the good fortune of a repeat occurrence of what uh, transpired last time. Let's stay here. We've had action, though. We've had rocks thrown at us. And uh, get some photographic evidence to correlate with the, the rock throwing activity that we experienced last time. But the team will need more than photographic evidence for the scientific community. Uh, zoology wants a type specimen. They want some bone, some DNA, some skin or a body. Dr. Greg Bambinek, a psychiatrist and wildlife expert, has come prepared. And that's why I've got a gun with a, a biopsy dart to get the DNA, a gun with a transmitter dart so we can uh, follow the critter with a Yagi antenna and either see where he lives or, or even with an airplane and get some real close-up photos um, and get some of the evidence that's needed so science can take this a little more seriously. I want to know more about the area. I want to know if it's, if it's feasible that an animal uh, of that size uh, with the ability to throw, that's an ape, could live in this area what other animals live in this, in, in this area and what it is that they're eating. Joining Meldrum and Bambinek is primatologist Esteban Sarmiento. With over 30 years experience studying primates in the field, including great apes, Sarmiento is a published author and is well recognized within the scientific community. Having someone see that this animal that has access to the scientific community would make its importance much more emphasized. Uh, an experienced and, and well uh, reputation field primatologist such as Esteban uh, taking interest in the evidence and the data that have, have accumulated to date and, and uh, making the effort to come and investigate for himself I think is an important step forward. Repeating his role from the 2006 expedition, Doug Hycheck will oversee the technical aspects of the mission. Hycheck is a wilderness television producer and camera expert 
who believes that implementing surveillance technology is key. I've been very successful in helping develop very simple camera systems for animal surveillance. And I've applied some of those techniques here. And uh, I'm really hoping that uh, we'll have some luck in getting close-up footage of one of these things. Rounding out the team is Hicheck's son and technical assistant, Blaine Hicheck. Three years ago, uh, we had some rock throwing, some wood knocking, and uh, it made me very curious as to what uh, has been doing this. So I think, think that uh, maybe this time, since we brought more technology, we might be able to see what it is. The team plans to use a three-pronged approach. Infrared cameras mounted on the cabin, camera traps hidden around the perimeter of the forest, and audio and video recorders that will be running continuously inside a custom-made blind. Before leaving Minneapolis, Hytrick had a canvas tent-like structure designed to conceal the glow of their electronic equipment at night and hide the person assigned to monitor the video screens. Uh, the blind, I think, is, a, is an excellent uh, strategy. It allows us to uh, portray the appearance of having everyone having gone to bed or the cabin being quiet, while yet uh, some of us are, are still hard at work uh, uh, monitoring the perimeter of the cabin. The list of gear and supplies the team will need for 12 days is extensive. It will take the plane several trips to transport all the gear. The view from the air shows just how isolated the cabin is. The camp is the only dwelling on the lake, and the only way in is by float plane. The team will be on their own. After unloading the gear, the first order of business is to set up the blind. You can't see through. I mean, it's pitch black when you're yeah, outside. Yeah. We got to figure out where the door is. Once the blind is assembled, they must then create their surveillance network. Do you guys want to hook up all your camera systems? Plug in the power to all your camera systems. Okay, it looks like all four are working. Let's do it. Let's install these. All right. All right. The first step is we're going to drill holes. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck's not going to like us. Infrared cameras will be mounted in strategic positions on each side of the cabin, networked back to the monitors in the blind. Each camera has an invisible infrared light source, which allows the camera to capture images in total darkness. Right there, but a little bit to the left. Keep the same height. And we'll get them all installed, and we'll go through, and we'll tweak them all with angle and whatnot. I just want to get this done before an April. Let's go. Number two. All right. We only got That's going to be on the other side. The cameras are strategically mounted on the eaves of the cabin. The objective is to avoid alerting the intruder that it is being watched. Looks like there's something obstructing the right side. That looks good. We're ready for final install. After some final adjustments, everything is set. The cameras will be monitored from the blind inside the cabin. The crew decided that I had the first shift. At the first sign of any activity, Hycheck will alert the rest of the team. Nightfall brings not only darkness, but an almost deafening silence over the isolated fishing camp. But could evidence collected from another frightening encounter at Snellgrove reveal the identity of the monster? We can really start to see some of the microscopical features that allow us to make the identification. This isolated fishing cabin on Snellgrove Lake, Ontario, has long been the target of aggressive attacks by an unknown creature. In some cases, the aggression was focused on the cabin itself. Other times, it was seemingly directed at the inhabitants. In 2002, the cabin was completely ransacked. In 2006, Monster Quest researchers were the targets of rock throwing, and they collected DNA evidence that points to a primate. In 2007, the attacks continued. Well, in 2007, there was a bunch of us that, uh, well, actually five of us that went up fishing uh, at Snowgrove Lake. Dave Regal was a member of a fishing party staying at the cabin. 
his second night at Snowgrove Lake would be a night he will never forget. Because it doesn't take me long to fall asleep, and I was tired and relaxed, and um, I'm a sound sleeper. And all of a sudden, I heard this big crash, and didn't know if somebody fell out of bed. I kind of sat up, looked around in our room, because there was three of us in our room, and everything was fine and started to lay back down and all of a sudden there was another like something was thrown at the cabin and the cabin kind of shook and not knowing it woke all of us up and uh we all went out into this big room where the dining area is and saw that out on the through the patio doors out on the deck Table was knocked over, chair, the rod case, my rod case, which is about six and a half feet long, was laying down uh, like it had bounced back off something. Whatever shook the cabin may also have left behind a clue on Regal's rod case, a clue that could point to the identity of the attacker. One of the things that we noticed once daylight came, and it was, one of the fellows just happened to, to see it, was down on, I have a name tag that's on this case, uh, and there was a, a long hair on it, and picked it up and didn't really think too much about it, but uh, they thought, well, maybe we should take this back. Could this hair belong to the creature that terrorized the cabin? Or is it possible that it was already on the rod case before the case was thrown? Will we be able to identify whether or not this hair is human or non-human? Jay Beckett is a microscopist with Microtrace, a private independent laboratory specializing in the identification of small quantities of unknown materials. He will be examining the hair to determine its origin. Uh, it came from Canada. It was uh, involved in some sort of mysterious disturbance in a cabin in a remote location, and uh, it was sent to us for identification. To positively identify the hair, it will be necessary to compare it to other known samples. So here at Microtrace, we maintain a physical reference collection of both human and animal hair. And currently, we have uh, over 1,500 uh, animal hair samples that have been cataloged and are accessible via our database. As the hair undergoes initial study and testing, the team out at Snellgrove Lake is hoping to collect additional evidence. Blaine Hijack has been up all night watching the monitors for activity, but the first night proves to be uneventful. Day two, the plan is to deploy camera traps in the surrounding forest. Accompanying the cameras will be scent lures to appeal to the creature's sense of smell. We're using a lot of olfactory uh, cues to try and draw it in because that's what you do when you're hunting an animal. And you want to draw them in to get a close-up with, with the camera traps. Sandwiched between two pheromone ships is a radio transmitter. Transmitters are typically used by biologists for tracking wildlife. In the event it is moved, the team will be able to track it electronically. Oh boy. Well, only seven more to do. The bait and camera stations are positioned at strategic points in the vicinity of the cabin to try to capture the attention of whatever may be lurking nearby. While Babinek puts out the rest of the traps, Sarmiento plans to determine if this habitat can sustain a large primate-like animal. You know, if it's a mammal that exists and it's real, like all other mammals, it has certain necessities. It has to breathe, it has to eat, and it has to reproduce. It's the food, really, that sort of tells you it has to be in certain areas. In addition to spruce grouse, identified as a potential food source in a previous expedition, Sarmiento has found other possibilities. The floor here 
is covered mostly by moss. Some of it is lichen. And as we we'll walk by, we'll be able to see some of the lichen. And lichen's always an, uh, a, a, a food for animals. Ferns, which are also plentiful on the forest floor, are a common food source for some animals. In the higher areas, raspberry and blueberry plants are thick, though they have yet to fully ripen. Uh, there's no doubt a large primate could sustain himself here. There's just the other large, other large mammals do it, and the, the truth is that a primate is a generalist. He's, he eats a wide variety of foods, and um, doesn't really depend on any one food, generally. One of the food sources that we can't see are the underwater food sources. And we have an awful lot of lakeshore. And a lot of these food sources, where they be cattails, lilies, and another assortment of aquatic and semi-aquatic plants, have tubers and they have um, leaves that are really edible to, to, to the animals. And in fact, for an animal like moose, such plants, such aquatic plants, provide a large portion of their diet. So uh, any large animal may come here to get berries, and if it's not a carnivore and it subsists on, on plants, it would doubtless go to the shores to get the tubers and some of their starches. The second night is Sarmiento's turn in the blind. As the minutes turn into hours, morning comes, again, without incident. I, I, I was really hopeful that the night might bring uh, sounds or movements of, of some of the mammals that live here, but the night went without incident. Today, the team will deploy another attractant in an effort to lure the creature in. The scent and the method are unique. Uh, one technique that we're trying on this trip is to use uh, grade ape uh, urine collected during the menstrual cycle. In this case, we have gorilla urine that was collected from a zoo specimen. The scent is intended to appeal to either the creature's primal instincts or its curiosity. This stuff we're going to be putting on a little tripod. I've developed a little uh, scent odorizer. It's almost like the olfactory organ itself. It's got little leaves, and so the wind is going to carry these pheromones from the gorilla urine out. And we've got a, a southeast wind, and so it's going to go back into the forest. And the end of the dock, they can't get to the end of the dock uh, across water going to draw them right past the cabin, past our cameras that are concealed here. Silence falls over the camp along with the darkness. But little do they know that while Snellgrove is quiet, just over 100 miles away, Sasquatch is making headlines, and DNA testing may be making history. It's uh, basically in the center of a mystery, and we are solving that. For years, this cabin on Snowgrove Lake, Ontario, has been the focus of a menacing attacker, causing destruction and tormenting the inhabitants. For five days and four nights, Monster Quest researchers have been trying to collect evidence of what has been terrorizing the cabin. The team hopes to capture photographic proof of whatever left the tissue sample behind on this board back in 2005. Material clinging to these, the threads on these screws in a few places. Uh, does that look like tissue to you? It kind of does. Subsequent DNA testing yielded an astonishing conclusion. I got DNA that was primate DNA, and I knew that I might be looking at the DNA of a Sasquatch. Now, more extensive DNA testing is underway to find out what left it behind. We have been able to uh, obtain uh, uh, DNA sequences from very old material, very degraded sort of uh, material. Dr. Mirdad Hajibabai is a molecular biologist with the Canadian Centre for DNA Barcoding at the University of Guelph. He believes their unique approach may enable him to solve this mystery. We recently analyzed a sample that is about 150 years old and uh, it's uh, basically in the center of a mystery and we are solving that using the uh, technique that we've developed here. Unlike the process used by Kurt Nelson in 2006, which used specific ape primers, Haji Babai has developed primers capable of amplifying any DNA, making it ideal for unknown specimens. What we do usually is to try to look at a smaller fragments of DNA. You can go after a smaller fragment from that barcode, a mini barcode, and this is typically about 100 base fragments. And oftentimes that 
100 base or 100 nucleotide information is enough to, to make a good identification. As Dr. Haji Babai attempts to extract DNA from the tissue collected in 2006, the researchers at Snellgrove are hoping to make a visual identification of the beast that has been attacking the cabin. It's the whole Six nights have passed, and so far their tactics have not provoked an attack. We have tried a lot of things, the wood knocking, call blasting, we've put out the camera traps, baiting with scent, baiting with the, the Sasquatch pheromone chips. We've been trying uh, a lot of things and we haven't had much success. But the next morning, a surprise visit from a local bush pilot brings news that the creature may be near. He just heard that there was two people a woman and a child, they're blueberry picking, and they saw a Sasquatch. And find now, out. This, came, he can on, phone this the... came on the airplane radio? No, just the local radio. Local radio. Okay. Further research indicates the location of the sighting is quite close. So they, they saw it around here, grassy narrows. That's what they yep. say, right? Yep, right there. Yeah. Jeff, it's only 115 miles 115 on the GP. Miles. Straight line. Straight, straight line. line. Do you think it's possible an animal would actually just follow the wave of berries? Oh, sure, I think that would be very likely. Very reasonable possibility. Don't you think, Greg? If yes, and this is a late, um, a late spring around here, and so the blueberries are late. So, yeah, if it's following blueberries, because around here they're small and green, there's a lot of them, so it's going to be a good crop. But, yeah, why be around here if you're eating a lot of blueberries when you've got to be 100 miles yeah. southwest? Bears are known to migrate in search of food. Is it possible that this creature would as well? There are documented stories that suggest Sasquatch eats blueberries. An affidavit from William Rowe in 1955 describes the following encounter that happened on Micah Mountain, just 80 miles west of Jasper, Alberta. Rowe had just come out of some brush into a clearing when he saw what he thought was a grizzly bear in the blueberry bushes. A moment later, it stepped into the clearing, and Rowe quickly realized it was not a bear. He estimated the creature to be six feet tall, almost three feet wide, and 300 pounds, covered head to toe with dark brown, silver-tipped hair. The creature squatted down on its haunches and reached out its hands. It pulled the branches of berry bushes toward its mouth and ate. Upon seeing Rowe, the creature stood upright and walked away on two legs. Could the lack of blueberries at Snellgrove explain the lack of activity? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it, it lends sort of a, an, a, a very plausible ecological explanation for why this year seems to be different than the previous years. Day eight, the float plane is back with more news of the sighting. I talked to the gentleman's wife yeah. oh. yesterday, because I called, this is, this is the lady that saw the Bigfoot. This is the gentleman, which I believe is her brother or brother-in-law. He went there, talked her into going back, and he brought the casting stuff, took a casting. He said they found the footprints, made their castings, they saw where it was eating berries, yeah. everything. With the report only a week old, and only 115 miles between Snowgrove Lake and Grassy Narrows, the team decides to shift the location of its search. Uh, we were scared. I had no idea what it was. It wasn't a bear or a moose, she stressed. It was upright and walking. It's like you're going to grassy narrows. OK. Could what they find be an undiscovered species? It was eight feet tall, um, uh, pitch black. For centuries, northern Canada has been home to mysterious reports of strange creatures with sometimes aggressive behavior. And in recent years, something has been leaving its violet mark at this isolated fishing cabin at Snellgrove Lake, Ontario. DNA collected at the site was analyzed and found to be that of a non-human primate. The result raised as many questions as it answered. Now, MonsterQuest is testing it more extensively to reach a definitive conclusion. But this is not the only physical evidence from Snowgrove Lake. In 2007, Dave Regal reported that he and others in his party were the victims of an attack in the dead of night. Like something was throwing at the cabin. 
Hair collected from that fishing rod case is being analyzed for evidence of its species. Does it belong to a human or a creature of unknown origin? Right now we're observing the hair under approximately 400 times magnification, going up to our highest powered objective. And now we're viewing the hair at roughly 630 times magnification. And we can really start to see some of the microscopical features that allow us to make the identification. As the examination continues at Microtrace, the team at Snellgrove Lake has decided to cut their stay short in order to investigate a creature sighting 115 miles to the south. After retrieving the camera traps, they pack up camp and head to Grassy Narrows. Well, the past seven days have not yielded much, so it might be good to go move to where there's actually been a sighting. Located just 181 miles from Winnipeg, Grassy Narrows is an Ojibwe First Nation settlement with a population of just over 800. After the initial flight into Kenora, Ontario, it's just a two-hour ride by car to interview the witnesses at Grassy Narrows. I thought I was seeing things. Helen Papasse and her mother encountered the creature as they were pulling up to one of their favorite blueberry picking spots. We come to uh, a winding road, and then all of a sudden, this black figure comes on, and she says in Ojibwe, what is that coming towards us? And I looked at her, I said, did you see that too, Mom? And she said, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's saying she was so, um, she couldn't believe, she couldn't believe what she'd just seen. It was eight feet tall, um, uh, pitch black, I'd say blacker than black. We seen it walk off and into the bush. Suggestions that it may have been a bear are quickly dismissed. But this thing was upright upright, human-like, but it still didn't look human. It was a creature. To me, it looked, I don't know, just, it wasn't, I know it wasn't an animal. The beast was so disturbing that Helen's mother refuses to ever return. She says it ruined her blueberry picking, her rice picking, and to go out there alone, this, this thing ruined it all, she says. Helen's brother convinced her to show him where she saw the creature. We searched this area, and this one spot by the, uh, by the mud puddle there, that's where we found a, a real good print. There, there was some uh, bear tracks. It's obvious there were bear tracks. But, but this print, you could tell it's human-like. Randy Fobister says other evidence left behind raises many questions. Okay, There's branches that are broken that's way too high. A moose couldn't, his neck wouldn't be long enough to reach there and grab those sticks. So we, thought, we thought that was weird, the way those sticks were uh, broken and bent down, just a few. Fobister takes the researchers out to the area where the sighting occurred. So is this the spot, Randy? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the spot. Signs indicate the area is well traveled by bear and other wildlife. But the researchers are anxious to see where the footprints were found. Perhaps there are others, or more importantly, physical evidence left behind. Where that, where that red tape is, that's where we had found that the good, the good print where we could actually uh, put the, the pl plaster on. But first, Meldrum wants to take a look at the cast. I don't know if that looks like a... Well, this is interesting. You could see those six toes, eh? But I, I didn't really do a good job of uh, putting the plaster on. Right. Um, the Sasquatch tracks that I'm familiar with, uh, being a primate, they have a very distinctive and very round, broad heel pad mm -hmm. un under that heel bone. Yeah. And it makes a, a very distinct, not a distinctively round um, heel. Meldrum believes the print may have been made by a bear. You've got the possibility of a forepaw right here, one forepaw, and then you have this nice series of toes 
one, two, three, four, five, and, and the curve right there of another pad. In fact, this would be the adult and this would be the, the cub. Two prints overlapping each other could account for length, width, and the additional toes. However, when compared to the print of a bear, differences come to light. So, I mean, by comparison to this adult bear, that big toe is, is pretty large. I mean, even the largest uh, toe on a bear, which is the outside toe, this would be the, the right paw, the outside toe is usually the largest, um, it still doesn't quite fit the bill for this toe here. Because of the condition of the substrate material from which the print was taken, it is difficult for Meldrum to come to a definitive conclusion. But a search of the area soon turns up something else. Oh, it's too, it's really a little bit too big to be bare. What do you think about that, huh? Nestled on the shoreline of Ontario Snowgrove Lake, a cabin sits alone in the vast Canadian wilderness. Solitary, but for one uninvited and destructive visitor who watches and waits. This isolated cabin has been the focus of physical attacks. Too remote and inaccessible to be vandalism and too powerful to be a bear. This man says he was inside as the creature shook the building. This man says something destroyed the interior. This expert says it wasn't caused by bears. This team of researchers is determined to solve the mystery, and this scientist may already have the answer. Dr. Merdan Hajibabai has been extracting DNA from tissue samples collected from a nail board left out at the cabin as a deterrent. We had three specimens, and uh, one uh, is a hair uh, sample, and, uh, and there are two sort of uh, uh, tissue type. Previous testing indicated primate DNA. However, further analysis was required to make a definitive identification of the attacker. It looked quite uh, degraded. I, I, my understanding is that this, these have uh, been collected uh, a few years ago. The material that we received, we, uh, uh, we did a rigorous testing on it uh, to, to purify the DNA and to, uh, to amplify these barcode regions using different primers and different settings. Uh, this allows us to look for uh, different groups of organisms. And uh, the DNA that came from the material uh, uh, belongs to uh, fungi and, uh, and bacteria. These are harm harmless fungi and bacteria from environment. They can be on soil uh, or water. And uh, so uh, we did not find any, uh, any animal uh, DNA uh, or any primate. Uh, DNA. So why would the results differ with those of the first test done in 2006? One possibility is that the first test may have contained human DNA as a result of contamination. Or perhaps the sample is now too degraded to extract DNA at all. We might be able to, to design um, uh, some, uh, some new tests using uh, next generation of, uh, of sequencing uh, uh, DNA sequencing machines. The Snellgrove expedition team has shifted the focus of their search to Grassy Narrows, the location of a recent Sasquatch sighting. Oftentimes things come to my attention that are years or even decades old. And uh, uh, it's, it's a very different situation to be able to interview a witness with very fresh memories of, of an event, of an encounter, of their impressions of, of what it is they saw. Interviewing witnesses may offer insight, but more significantly, there could be other evidence here. Right, here's some, some more disturbances here. The team searches the area for other footprints or signs of the creature. There is a great deal of evidence of wildlife. Yeah, this seems like it's been torn open by some animal looking for grub. And now chances are it's a bear. And I guess you can see here, it looks like that's a claw mark. That's a claw mark. The heavy traffic from curiosity seekers has made the search more difficult. So you can see some of the grass has been trampled here that were here before. 
of our pond a berry. Here's these berries. I don't know what kind of berries those are. Hmm, these are the June berries. June berries, huh? And yet, right next to a berry bush, Sweet. a sign. And the animal's been eating June berries. That's well, that. Raspberries. I just, I just ate a raspberry. What is that, bear or? Oh, it's too. It's really a little bit too big to be bear. Can you see the? That's the. Hmm. What do you think about that, huh? A fresh track means a fresh trail. It, it, it's partly it being open, but this is all this has all been smashed down. That extrusion right there, right here. Yeah. But sure, sure. It seems to have a ridge here in the middle, going this way. So these are the toes, little toes. These are this is the big toe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of definition, but it's definitely something big that. Yeah. Put its weight there, and it doesn't seem like it's human. No. And, it, and I can't see how it could be a bear. Whatever it is, it's good size, right? The size and impression of the track leaves them to question just what could have made that footprint, and is it following the crop of berries? Questions that fuel the mystery surrounding Sasquatch. Obviously, there's signs of animals, like lots of them. And the reason they're there is because there's a lot of food here. Raspberries and blueberries, I mean, there's whole hills covered with them. When the previous attacks on the cabin at Snowgrove Lake occurred, various berries, including blueberries, were fully ripe. This year, spring and summer have come late to Snowgrove, and the berries are delayed. But 115 miles south at Grassy Narrows, the berries are at their peak. Could this be another clue to the identity of the creature? Animal migrations are known to follow available food sources. And while a comparative analysis between Ontario Sasquatch sightings and berry ripening patterns does not yet exist, it is possible the two overlap. The Snell Grove trip was in some ways disappointing, but in other ways it was a real education for me. In short, we were in the right place, but at the wrong time. While it is still unclear why the creature returns to the isolated cabin on Snowgrove Lake, perhaps other evidence can determine what it is. The hair on the rod case from 2007 may still hold the answer. So we have the hair that was sent from Canada mounted up for examination. We have it under the polarized light microscope being viewed at approximately 630 times uh, magnification. And you can see here, as a longitudinal view of the hair, we have the cuticle, which is the outermost layer of the hair running on the edges, top and bottom, uh, everything in the middle of the hair is cortex, and you can see the light brown pigment granules that are dispersed uh, in that cortex. Um, there is no medulla, the innermost portion of the hair, um, in this particular hair. Uh, the medulla is absent, where it, if it had been present, it would be running down the middle of the hair here, but you can see there is no medulla. Beckert explains the absence of medulla can be a natural variation in some human hairs. However, his examination reveals another unexpected discovery. And you can see by looking here that this region of the hair has been bleached. Um, it's colorless in this region, and it has the characteristic texture of a hair that has been bleached. In order to confirm the hair has been bleached, Beckett conducts a staining test. The hair is placed in blue dye, then washed thoroughly. If the hair has been bleached, the dye will remain. So we have the hair um, after it has been uh, stained with the methylene blue, uh, and it has been thoroughly washed. And now we see that the hair has retained the blue color of the stain. And the fact that the hair has retained that blue color uh, indicates that this hair has been uh, artificially bleached. And it is a human head hair, most likely of a Caucasian. But the mystery remains, what threw the rod case at the cabin? The body of evidence in support of a large creature prowling the Ontario wilderness is mounting. Eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the creature. A possible migratory pattern linked to the ripening of an abundant food source. And repeated attacks on the isolated cabin. You know, it has to either be a human or it has to be one of these animals. It has to be something with hands. It just can't be any other explanation for it. These rocks and logs aren't falling out of the sky. Uh, moose don't throw logs, bears don't throw logs. And so I really also want to solve the mystery. Given the right tools, uh, I think science can solve the mysteries. 
I'm confident about it. This is an enormous area. And, you know, that it could support something that's totally new. There's no doubt about that. Whether uh, it does is another question. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we have someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? What person or an animal or? I can't tell. All I know is my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. A good sized man or something. It looks like a man. I don't know what it was. Just it, it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. Couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here coming through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. You see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he in your yard? He's looking at me. Okay. His eye is on foot. This... I don't know what... It, it, it's a big, real big person. That's all I can say. Okay, it is a, it is a person. <laughs> Yeah, I just was a person or somebody really big. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. Bigfoot is one of the most widely recognized creatures in the world, yet the scientific community says it does not exist. There are reports all over North America, but the epicenter seems to be Washington State, with over 800 documented sightings. If this thing weighed close to 400 pounds or more. It had an extremely pointed head. This thing was huge, eight, nine feet tall. This noise was like Nothing I've heard before. I found 14 and a half uh, inch footprints. Eyewitnesses describe a human-like ape creature up to 10 feet tall, broad-shouldered, hairy, and upright walking. But where is the evidence? This monster quest search will field two different expeditions into the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. One led by wildlife biologist Dr. Briggs Hall using proven scientific research methods. Well, we've thought of several ways that we might draw this animal in front of the camera. The second expedition is made up of all women. They have a more unorthodox plan to bring Bigfoot close enough for a photograph. I think that they respond to women differently than they respond to men. Monster Quest will also examine existing evidence and what may be the strangest Bigfoot print of all. The heel is much larger. And in addition, Two analyses will look at the most controversial piece of Bigfoot evidence. Critics say the Patterson footage shot in 1967 is fake. First, experts analyze the footage to see if a man in a suit could possibly reproduce the creature's walk. Yeah, so if it's real, then it is a, it's a funny gait. Then a first. The Patterson footage has always been blurry, but now, using a digital microscope, we get the best look yet at the creature's face and make a startling discovery. The creature first made national news in 1958 when construction worker Jerry Crew found and cast footprints measuring 17 and a half inches long near Bluff Creek, California, located 86 miles from Eureka. Locals nicknamed the creature Bigfoot and the name stuck. Over the next decade, national interest in the story mostly faded until October 20th, 1967, when Roger Patterson, an amateur filmmaker, set out to Bluff Creek to do a documentary on a recent footprint discovery. But what Patterson found shocked the world. He shot 953 frames of film that many believe is the best evidence of Bigfoot. You will see that film in its entirety for one of the first times on television. Patterson passed away in 1972, never wavering from his story. But he was not alone on that fateful day. 
a massive bicep in the arm was, you know, wide like that. And as it moved, you could see the muscles ripping in the thighs. And the arms, even underneath that hair, you could see the difference in the, in the, you know, in the movement. Bob Gimlin was with Roger Patterson that day and for almost 40 years was able to stay out of the limelight and controversy. But in 2004, he did this interview recounting that day in 1967. The, the weather was great in October, so we, uh, Roger said, let's ride back up in some of them areas. We rode up that way, uh, up that creek bed away from our camp, which was probably a couple of miles. As we came around, uh, uh, there was a big downfall tree with a root system in the dirt, like a crow's nest, logs jammed together. As we came around that, then, uh, of course, the horses just blew up, and this thing was standing right alongside the creek, on the opposite side of the creek that we were on. It was massive. Uh, and, the, and the commotion of trying to get the camera out of the, of the saddlebags while his horse was jumping around. I was watching the creature, and it was walking away. By well, the time we got the horses kind of settled down, and Roger ran across the creek, and Roger had the camera to his eye, and then he stumbled kind of and fell down on his knees, and then he got back up, and he ran over to a log that was a little ways away and stabilized himself on the log. And by the, at that time, I rode across the creek on my horse and just sat over there. The creature makes a turn, slight turn with its shoulders and kind of looks back. That's when I rode across the creek on the horse. That's when it made that, that gesture. So I was looking at it from the back. There are some trees or vegetation that was getting between Roger and the creature, and he wanted to get a better and closer. So he relocated, and when he did, he asked me if I would cover him, which meant, uh, get the rifle and, and see, you know. And there was no intent to shoot this thing at all. Then uh, the creature just kept right on walking. At the time, it was hard for Gimlin to determine just how large the creature was. But he did find footprints. And people asked me, well, what do you think it weighed? And I thought, well, well it takes a big man to weigh 350. So I said, oh, probably 350 pounds. We weren't here when they got a whole, uh, got a, an impression gauge, and, and of course they, they estimate after that that it was a, a 700 or so pounds, or, or you know, it was tremendously heavier than I'd thought. Patterson and Gimlin tracked the creature for miles, but never saw it again. And that's where the trail ended and the controversy began. So much research has been done on the film ball by both myself and by scientists and by many other people. And everybody who really gets into that film says there's no way that whatever that is, is a man in the suit. Over the years, numerous people have come forward claiming they were the man in the monkey suit. However, no one has ever been able to produce proof. I'm not impressed by the stories of people who've come forward and said that they're the man in the suit. Uh, one particular gentleman doesn't even know how to get to the, f the film site. The controversy continues, and this episode of Monster Quest adds fuel to the fire by analyzing the footage like never before. The film is, is just that. It's a, the film subject is, is, is an image on celluloid. Owen Caddy is an expert in digital photography and has acquired the actual 16 millimeter film shot by Roger Patterson. To my great surprise, the, there was uh, additional detail that uh, apparently had never been seen before. Caddy and fellow researcher Richard Knoll will use a high resolution digital microscope to take a digital photo of each frame from the Patterson footage. If this image is really a man in a monkey suit, seams or fabric could become visible under microscopic examination. If it is a real animal, muscles or other biological identifiers may also appear. Another group of scientists is also looking at the Patterson footage. Is this gate a human gate? Is it a non-human gate? Is it from similar to something that we know? Or not. Dr. Jurgen Konsak was an associate director of the Human Sensory Model Lab at the University of Minnesota. When in 2004, he conducted an experiment 
as simple as taking a walk. So what, so what you do is if you're down, you walk like this, and this is exactly what he's doing. This lab is devoted to, to, to motor control, to how people, humans, uh, not only walk, but actually uh, are able to move. One hot topic of internet conversation is the wobbly gait or walk of the Patterson subject. Skeptics say it is a man having difficulty walking in a heavy, bulky monkey suit. But proponents say a human is not physically able to walk like this. The results of this experiment have never been revealed until now. It seems to be, despite the size, a relatively smooth walk. Um, and it doesn't seem to be like a, a lot of oscillations in terms of, you know, the center of gravity moving up or down. Using an optic electronic camera system, Dr. Konzak plans to compare the gait of the figure in the film with that so of a human. swing your whole arm. Good, and I'll swing your whole leg. All right, there we go. Paleoanthropologist Esteban Sarmiento from the American Museum of Natural History in New York is joining Dr. Konzak in the experiment. Sarmiento has studied large wild apes in Africa. I am totally open-minded as to the question of Bigfoot existing in the Northwest. There has to be something to these reports. For the test, an athlete with good range and muscle control has been chosen. He will try to match the gait of the creature while his every movement is recorded frame by frame. So what we have is these light bulbs that we've attached to some anatomical landmarks. They basically reflect infrared light that is sent out from uh, LEDs next to the cameras. It's been reflected, and then the camera actually picks it up. The computer then reconstructs the points of light as a three-dimensional figure. Yeah, we see them all in all cameras, so that's good. His elbow, so he's, this is fine, he has to... Just slide. bring his, his elbow. Kinesiology oh, is the study of human movement and is fundamental in developing treatments for problems in the musculoskeletal system. The question before Dr. Jurgen Konzak and Dr. Esteban Sarmiento is, can a human replicate the gait of the thing in the Patterson film? Is, is, is that okay now? Just let's check his legs and then I'll go up and bend his arms. Tiny bit? Mm, yeah, try to straighten up the back just a tiny bit. Yeah, that's it. What we're going to do with this arm is we're going to just pick up your shoulder just a little bit. Okay? Yeah. Does that look a little bit better? Yeah. Three, two, one. Okay, lights uh -oh. off. Recording. Move. He's like a big plasticine. He's like a big plasticine doll. Right there, he's up. He's got his. Oh. See that? Yeah, he's up off the. Right there, he's totally up. That's, you see, like, right there. Yeah, it's it's yeah. just like as high as he's ever going to come. Right. And now he's going like, to actually bring his leg yeah. through. The most telling problem is in the subject's knee movement. Yeah, that has to be back. There's it means. one sequence of frames in there, I think, where we, I think we're pretty good. And where you clearly see that uh, there is this lateral rotation at the knee and where the foot is kind of like, you know, going outward, this, which is called inversion. Um, and so, and that is something that it seems uh, rather strange. The unusual gait of the creature in the Patterson film has received considerable scrutiny. Skeptics say it is a man struggling to walk in a heavy monkey suit. But proponents claim it is impossible for a human to replicate the wobbly walk. Uh, shoulder markers are roughly around five feet, so we'll, you know, if we'll go a little further, we should be fine. Dr. Konzak wants to see if this athlete is able to put his body into the seemingly awkward positions of the Patterson subject. If he can, then it is reasonable to assume the walk could be replicated, and it could be a man in a monkey suit. However, you know, if you look at this gate, I think we can clearly say it is not the walk of the large ape that we know today. Said he doesn't walk like a human and he doesn't walk like an ape. The athlete couldn't do it. He could not walk like whatever or whoever was caught on film. Another group of researchers believe they too have evidence of Bigfoot. 
I consider the Skookum expedition to be one of the most important expeditions in the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomena. Alan Terry is a member of a group of Bigfoot researchers and wildlife biologists who in 2000 set out to a remote spot in the shadow of Mount St. Helens, Washington called Skookum Meadows to find evidence of the creature. What led us to the Skookum Expedition site was a line of treetops that were snapped off as if in a trail. Apes are known to break branches to mark territory to ward off other males. Encouraged that they were on the right track, they baited a trap for the beast. They set out apples in a large mud wallow, hoping to lure the creature in and leave footprints as evidence of its visit. It worked. Some of the bait was taken, and a large impression was left behind in the soft mud. The impression looked like a large humanoid creature with very long flowing hair. And it was considerably heavy as it had left a very deep impression into the mud. The imprint appears to be the lower half of the animal's body, painstakingly preserved with nearly 200 pounds of plaster. As the animal reached for the apples, the forearm, buttock, and lower leg sunk into the mud, and they found hair detail on all parts of the cast. But the most revealing detail was in a partial heel print. There were dermal ridges, the tiny lines that make unique fingerprints in all primates. In Bigfoot research, we consider the Skookum cast to be uh, one of the most important finds, probably second only to the Patterson-Gimlin film. The Skookum cast was found in a valley called Skookum Meadows near Mount St. Helens, Washington, located 150 miles from Seattle in the Cascade Mountains and 330 miles from where the Patterson footage was shot in Northern California. I've been uh, bigfooting for a couple years now. Christine Walls is a botanist who is planning a new and unique Bigfoot search here in Skookum Meadows. I have a theory about um, Bigfoot, and um, I think that they respond to, to women differently than they respond to men. A woman has a more, uh, like a gentleness to her. Our voices are higher, more lyrical. Based on the success of primate researchers Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey, Wall's entire team will be female. In fact, a man in the forest is probably makes, puts them on guard, makes them a little wary. And I, I think that uh, a female in the forest piques their interest. Walls will be joined by Melissa Hovey, Tracy Herigstad, Monica Rawlings, mm -hmm, and Kathy Strain. Women report having more close encounters with this animal. There seems to be the theory that um, this animal could be attracted to the female scent. They smell great. The team knows they must be much more than lucky. They will incorporate ape vocalizations and wood knocking, another well-documented primate communication technique. My goal is to make sure whatever we're doing is scientific. We find any kind of evidence that we're collecting it in a scientific manner so it can be analyzed and not contaminated, such as DNA or hair, or you know, apple bites that might be preserved that shows us teeth, those kinds of things. Another technique the team will use to draw the creature in on this expedition involves a less conventional approach. We sing um, Christmas carols and lullabies, um, mainly because those are the lyrics that we know. And so, but it actually works out fine because it's, uh, it ends up being um, <clears throat> songs that are very gentle again. I'd like to see us split into groups, perhaps early in the evening, um, do our own thing, maybe walk the roads, talk, sing. And then later in the evening, meet back at camp. Perhaps we, it would follow us in. In the event there is any activity at night, the women will be waiting with an array of low light cameras. Trying out various uh, camera systems, uh, infrared, thermal, and starlight technology. And uh, Skookum Meadows is just right. Um, the two hills that come together, I believe it's right at the bottom of the, the hill to the left. This spot has a long history with the beast. Paul Kane was a traveling artist, capturing scenes across the northwestern frontier in the 1840s. While in an area that is now Washington State, 
Kane made a journal entry describing Native American accounts of an ape-like creature they called Skookum. March 26, 1847. We arrived at the mouth of the Catalpoto River, 26 miles from Fort Vancouver. I stopped to make a sketch of the volcano, Mount St. Helens, distant, I suppose, about 30 or 40 miles. This mountain has never been visited by either whites or Indians. The latter assert that it is inhabited by a race of beings of a different species, who are cannibals, and whom they hold in great dread. They say that the Sukum is a giant. He is hairy. He eats people. They will not go where he lives. Skuka means mountain devil, so it's something that's very scary, something you don't want to have an encounter with. The fearsome behavior of the Skookum does not seem to match modern day descriptions as a creature that is shy, elusive, and yet curious. Just like the animal Christine Walls claims paid her a visit in 2004. I hear at the corner of the tent that something is touching the top of the tent. Christine Walls was camping in the Cascade Mountains when she had her first and only encounter with what she believes was a Bigfoot. It would like scrunch the um, tarps together and I could hear it and it was moving from side to side it, and then it would step on it again and then it would go away. Um, it would go away for maybe several minutes and then it would come back and I'd hear the stepping on the tarp again. I'd hear it scrunching the tarp again. It was, it was really having a great time. Walls never felt threatened. It was more like a curious encounter. She never got a look at the animal, and it left as suddenly as it had arrived. But this time, Christine will be prepared. I've got all of my tape recording equipment inside the tent, and so hopefully we'll have some activity tonight. We'll go ahead and set it up and see if we can't align it to make sure that it's pointing in the correct direction and it's at the right um, height off the ground. Motion-activated stealth camera traps will be positioned over bait throughout the area. So we need to mark, make sure we're marking it on the topo where we're putting the cameras and what time we're putting the cameras on. So our data recorder, make sure you record all that information so that we know when we're putting it out. We also need to count the apples, how many apples that we put out. Mm -hmm. And uh, whoever's handling the apples, we've got gloves, so we're not contaminating, putting our own scent back on it. The next morning, they search the area and make a discovery just outside the main okay. tent. Possible tracks here. Okay. Possible heel, toes. All right. And here. Let's yep. measure them. Let's measure them out. Okay. You want to do this? Length is approximately 15 and 3 quarters inches. The length on this one, about 14. The prints appear old and weathered, but the outline is clearly visible. For you since I left my gloves on. Let's go, girl. Melissa and Monica cast the footprints for later analysis hoping they may reveal dermal ridges or other details that might reveal the animal that made them. Footprints, they appear to be large, bipedal, barefoot type prints. Um, we haven't finished analyzing. I haven't seen the cast cleaned quite yet, so we'll have to judge from there what those will look like. At the very least, they believe they are in the right area. Properly cast impressions can leave revealing detail but determining what left the hair and bony imprints is another story. Some experts believe the skookum cast could have been made by a known animal. Yeah, I'd like to I'd be particularly interested in seeing that of an elk. Dr. Darius Swindler is a primate anatomist. He wants to do a comparison between an impression he made of the lower leg of an elk and what is believed to be the same anatomy from the skookum cast. Elk frequent mud wallows to cool off and deter insects. And when lying down, an elk might make an impression similar to that made by a large primate. But there is some similarity, I must confess. 
I'd like to be able to dissect this and just see how much of this is the muscle and how much is tendon. Owen Caddy is joining Swindler to see if there is anything in the cast that might cause the wobbly walk or slumped posture seen in the Patterson footage. They focus on the Skookum leg cast. Angle here is very different. Slope. Yeah, I mean, there's been some talk of maybe this is a feature from a slump, but yeah, nevertheless, that's what I was wondering before. This is this is concave. And yeah. This is convex mm -hmm. on the elk. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that a slump would totally would change that, it from a yeah. concave to a convex surface. Yeah, that's a good point. Really. Mm -hmm. The other section to show a substantial difference is the Achilles tendon. Again, the shapes are quite different. Mm -hmm. um, so this is much more vertical. Yeah. yeah, much more vertical, rounded. The differences between the two specimens would indicate that the Skookum impression was not made by an elk. But what about a primate? According to Swindler, the thick matted hair detail is not human, and the size and shape of the leg does not match any other known primate. Skeptics of Bigfoot say that evidence like the Skookum cast and the Patterson footage would be more believable if it had been discovered and collected by wildlife biologists. But many of these discoveries have been first reported by laymen. For 100 years, uh, the natives reported big gorillas in the jungle in Rwanda, and yet it wasn't until 1950 that they were found. Uh, certainly this area is as vast as that. And uh, so who can rule out the possibility that something like that couldn't exist here? I think it's possible. Dr. Briggs Hall has spent decades in these forests and mountains as a veterinarian for the state of Washington. Dr. Hall has never seen a Bigfoot himself, but he believes any elusive animal can be found if proven methods are used. So we're going to go back into the most remote areas, the deepest canyons, the highest ridges. We're going to be at least a mile, uh, set up our cameras at least a mile from any trail. The search for new evidence is underway. But what about the microscopic images of the Patterson footage? The enhancements are now done. And for the first time ever, new detail will be seen. This is the area where the horse becomes most lathered. We're hoping to get a lot of horse stink into this cloth, and then we're going to hang it in a tree in front of one of our camera traps. Dr. Briggs Hall has studied most of the large animal wildlife in Washington state, except Bigfoot. And I was a little frustrated that, uh, that uh, the scientific community and, and the government uh, biologists had not made any attempt at all to follow up on any of these reports. Hall had heard about Christine Wall's all-female Monster Quest expedition, made up of researchers, not scientists, and decided to investigate on his own. So what I'd like to do is come across, and if we could get up here and look at the headwaters of this creek up here, this looks like it's... Uh... And like Wall's, he too had an encounter with something he has difficulty explaining. Last summer I was up in the Goat Rocks wilderness with a group of biologists and we were capturing mountain goats. I don't sleep well in the sleeping bag, so I was tossing and turning, and about one o'clock in the evening, uh, one o'clock at night, I heard what sounded like two, two sticks being knocked together. And I'm in a rhythmic chunk, 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 and I never heard that in the forest before, and, uh, and I thought, what could that be? And I didn't have a flashlight, it was a very dark night, but it was coming from out behind the horses. I heard it three times between one o'clock and three o'clock in the morning. There was no question that I heard wood against wood. Um, and there's elk up there, there's deer up there, there's bear up there, there's mountain goats, there's cougars, but it takes hands to knock sticks together. And uh, so there's something else up there. At the time, Hall knew little of primate behavior and decided to do a little digging. When I started reading about mountain gorillas and orangutans that I found out that that's normal primate behavior. Hall believes the accounts of wood knocking and loud vocalizations could be apes communicating with one another possibly to warn of an intruder. If there really is such a thing as a great ape living in our mountains, he lives in the most remote areas. He's obviously very uh, shy and, and uh, goes to great uh, difficulty to avoid people. Hall's strategy is simple. Set up camera traps for an extended period of time and leave the area. 
a technique used by other wildlife researchers in search of elusive animals like tigers and jaguars. We'll be setting up camera traps using a stealth cam. And this is a, this is a uh, camera which uses both in, infrared technology as well as uh, detects motion. Okay? Now the idea is, is when, an when an animal walks in front of, of the beam, uh, it's going to snap a photo. And the photo is going to be a high resolution photo with, uh, in color. So uh, there should be no, uh, no problem distinguishing between a bear or an elk or a Bigfoot. Okay, if our bait is right here, I don't know, it looks pretty good, don't you think, son? Yeah, I think it's right on. Okay. Briggs Hall has chosen a remote area called Goat Rock, bordering the Yakima Indian Reservation, 64 miles from Mount St. Helens. He believes this would be a good place to hide if Bigfoot wanted to avoid humans. So it's going to be bushwhacking, so watch your step, and I think we'll go, let's go 20 minutes, and then we'll try to find some identifiable, uh, easily identifiable uh, landmark, because I'm, I'm wondering if our, we can get a GPS location under the trees. This is the general area where I heard the wood knocking last year, and so it seems to me that this is a, a, a good spot to put a camera. If Sasquatch really wanted to find a place to go where he could avoid people, this would be the perfect habitat. You know, the areas where we want, I want to put the cameras are, are quite spread out, so we're going to be hiking for four or five miles to the south and then four or five miles to the north. We're going into some really deep canyons, and we're also going to set a camera clear up in the scree on the very high ridge. So overall, these cameras are spread over probably 10 to 12 square miles. And just upstream from here, there's a major game tail crosses. So I'm thinking that's a great place to create a real stink and set up a camera. And the way the breeze moves up and down this canyon, we might just draw something in. The batteries will allow the cameras to operate for approximately 30 days, at which time Dr. Hall will return to retrieve them before elk season begins. Okay, I'm going to try to get the laser beam to hit right in those trees, okay? To help ensure chances of success, the team is using bait to help lure the great ape to the camera station. We're going to add some additional adornments this morning to our camera set. So we've got some CDs here, which we're going to hang in a tree and let the wind move them around, and hopefully that reflection will catch some attention. Uh, we're also going to be hanging up some uh, sliced up onions to create some smell. Hey guys, look at this game trail. Man, look at this, this is perfect. Got a perfect set of trees here. Got a, look, at, look at that. There's a lot of wildlife down here. Well used trail. Yeah. Okay, and it's high. The wind's gonna blow the scent around. This is, this is perfect, right? Right, right in the middle it. of the swamps. Let's do it. Apes, like many animals, display curiosity. And foreign objects and scents can bring animals in for a closer look. There's a lot of indications that Bigfoot is very curious, and there have been several situations where he's been attracted to music, so we're going to create some music for him. We're going to hang up some wind chimes. Dr. Hall has used wind chimes before. The strange, non-threatening sounds bring many animals closer to investigate. He is hoping for the same results with Bigfoot. As Hall and his team reach 6,800 feet near the top of the tree line, they make a discovery. Here we have another one that's pretty distinct. Several human-like footprints pushed into the loose dirt. This would be a strange place for someone to come in their bare feet. Uh, it seems awfully wide for a human track, but it's not a huge track like, like you would expect with Bigfoot, uh, but possibly it could be a young animal. Dr. Hall has brought along hunting guide Mark Alman who has 32 years of local animal tracking experience. It's not a bear track, and it's not a cat track. Here's the print here. It stepped on this stick right here, so it comes out to here. Um, and then we got another one here that's kind of a heel print, but there's no tin shoe marks or, I mean, nothing of, Nothing that a 
human would be leaving here. With measurements of nine inches long and four inches wide, it is possible a human could have made them, but they have not seen another man now in three days riding. They will deploy cameras in this area as well. Okay, for our last camera set, we're spraying this tree with uh, wintergreen pure essential oils. This is a very concentrated scent, which we're hoping will stay for a while. We set it up right along the game trail and right, right uh, close to the creek. So, uh, and we've also hung some uh, CD uh, discs up here to kind of spin around in the wind. So this is our, our last trap, and we'll see what happens. The cameras will have almost a month to do their work, at which time Hall will return to collect them and the photos they contain. Christine Wall's team has now been in the field for a total of five days. Mm -hmm. But we should, because that's definitely where the activity is coming from. And, the and have found something interesting. When I saw that, I actually started exploring the area a little more. And this is when I saw this other branch. It's broken in a similar fashion. You can see that none of the other longer branches are disturbed. So yeah. that makes me think something purposefully grabbed it and snapped it. And these also have been grabbed and instead of brushing to the side, they're actually pulled straight down. Oh, those are very, very fresh. Yeah. So this is a really interesting bedding site because you can actually see where this uh, grass has been just pushed down and bedded. And yeah. there's obvious branches that have been laid down. There's, there's no way that elk take branches off of trees and move them. I mean, if an elk breaks a tree limb, it's going to be right where the tree is. Or bear. There's not, or these, bear. these did not come off of this tree. This came from a different location. Something carried it here. However, there is no hard evidence of what made the nest. But having collected their camera traps, the team finds something has triggered the motion activated cameras. It's four pictures. If the stories of the legendary Bigfoot are to be believed, this primate is nearly eight feet tall and walks upright. And most eyewitnesses say it looks like this creature captured on film in 1967. This man was there when the film was shot. This man believes he made a body cast of a Bigfoot. Whatever made the impression was indeed very, very heavy. And this experiment concluded the walk of the subject in the Patterson footage is outside the range of a human. Monster Quest followed two expeditions in Washington state as researchers and wildlife biologists made an effort to find evidence of Bigfoot. Dr. Briggs Hall put out baited camera traps in a remote area where humans do not venture. Time for the payoff. We're finally gonna find out if we got pictures Mark, it says we've got 48 photos on camera number four. Well, you know, after a week of hard hiking and 30 days of the cameras being in place and a long, long day and part of a night on horseback, we're finally going to get a look at what's on these cameras. Dr. Hall's cameras collected over 90 images during the 30 days they were in commission. I would expect that we'll get some elk and we'll get some deer and maybe we'll get a bear too, maybe a coyote. And if we were incredibly lucky, possibly a Bigfoot. I tried to see if there was anything there that we could justify calling a Bigfoot, but there simply wasn't. Christine Wall's team was also camped near Mount St. Helens. They, too, had cameras in hand. That's interesting, OK. So it's number 113. Come here and look at this, and you tell me what you think. In the far right corner of the screen, there is a dark object. Is this the appendage of an animal just out of frame? When they examine additional images, they find traffic. The image is likely just the tail end of a truck hauling dark cargo. After viewing all the images from the camera traps, it is clear elk are everywhere, but no sign of a Bigfoot. And what about the footprint they found on day three? The cast provided no details. It is not known if there ever were dermal ridges, but if there, they have been washed away by the rain. 
However, they were able to find something of interest. We don't have a lot of bedding areas or nests that are recorded at all. I mean, I've excavated one. I know of a couple of others, and that's it. So this is pretty exciting in the Skookum area to have something like this. It's clearly not elk-related. It's no reason for a human to be doing this. For the past 40 years, the best evidence for Bigfoot has been the footage shot by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin in California. When I got to see the film, finally, when I got to see the film, yeah, I was really relieved to, to see that it, that he got that much because Roger said, I don't know, Bobby said, I'm not even sure that I got any film footage at all because he said, I fell down and I got relocated and then I got relocated again and then I ran out of film. For the first time, the original 16 millimeter film is being examined on a microscopic level. Researcher Owen Caddy used a digital microscope to take pictures of individual frames of the film. Joining Caddy is Dr. Darris Swindler. They are viewing the comparisons for the first time. They look first at the legs for any detail that might be compared to the Skookum cast. That one's sort of interesting, but uh, here's where they start to get really pretty interesting. Unfortunately, it's too grainy. So Darris, you can see here on this uh, image, it's uh, just the full color image digitally pulled off the film. But as they focus their attention on the subject's head, they make an amazing discovery. And as you look at the enhanced one, you can see that the level of detail has right. been pulled out. And you can get individual parts of the face. Yeah, you can resolve yeah. the individual parts of the face, the nostrils, mm -hmm. the mouth. When the original film is blown up to a headshot of the creature, the image becomes just a fuzzy blob. But when the enhanced digital image is blown up to the same size, the new details emerge. You could see the eyelids move up and down. That's muscle there around there, the circular muscle called the orbicularis oris. It particularly well developed was the masseter, this big muscle over here that moves the jaw. And this is the most interesting sequence of the mouth opening and closing. What's uh, interesting in that it shows the movement of um, the mouth and, and the sides of the face and the yeah. lips. So there's quite a bit resolved, and there's actually a lot of detail that uh, is consistent from frame to frame, mm -hmm. and you get a consistent facial morphology looking at multiple frames. People have often thought of the film subject's mouth as being higher up than it, higher up, than it yeah. actually uh, is. And you see how that can happen, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, here's a picture of Pan, yeah. um, a chimpanzee. And you think that the mouth is, is actually where this dark line is, but it's mm -hmm. actually below that uh, in the deep shadow. It's, there's a similar yeah, analogy that. here. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. comparison. <clears throat> If it had been a mask on some animal, a human or something like that, it was a well, <laughs> a well fabricated mask. I'll say that, which I sort of doubt now more than I would have back in those days. I don't see anything that stands out and, and glaringly says fake. You know, the way the mouth uh, can move and even makes. Uh, facial uh, expressions that are similar to those of chimpanzees, like uh, you know, the uh, compressed lip display. Uh, you know, I don't know who would think of that. Bob Gimlin, who is the only living eyewitness from that day in 1967, is certain of what he saw. I was watching the creature and it was walking away, but I could see the face real good and I could see the eyes. The digital view of the original Patterson footage did not reveal any telltale seams, zippers, or other evidence that would point to a man in a monkey suit, but rather seemed only to reinforce the eyewitness testimony. Somebody once told me, uh, you know, you never use a, a bigger hammer than you need for the job, and, and I imagine if they're going to film with 16 millimeter, they're not going to be concerned with details that fine. Um, I don't think anyone would have anticipated the ability to come back 40 years later and do uh, photo enhancements to show details uh, this great. I, I, I really regretted that I was there and saw it. 
because of the ridicule and because of my wife being upset at me and practically thinking about divorcing me because of the thing, you know, and uh, and the people saying they fake this and fake that, and you know, and uh, it, it just, it bothers a person. There's no way it, it can keep from bothering you if you've got a conscience. The new detail in the Patterson footage is intriguing, but inconclusive. Until a body is found or creature captured, many in the scientific community will remain skeptical. But on this day, more than 40 years after this film was shot, the Patterson footage remains the best evidence for those who believe Bigfoot is a real animal.